Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to week two of Moth Webinar. This week we're talking about sails and masts and uh, getting the, the combination correct, essentially. We're lucky to be joined by Rory Scott, who's our chief uh, designer for One Design and for the, for the Moth Sail. We've also got Paul Westlake, who's the uh, vice president of North Sails. He's going to talk to us about the 3DI material. And then we've also got Chris Dixon from CST Composites. He's going to talk to us about moth mass development, where they've got to with their new products and their new Topro product. Uh, before all that, I just want to uh, chat briefly about the, uh, the range we've got for, the, for, the, for 2020. Uh, the, the, the two sales we've launched this year are really a development of what T Tom Slingsley won the 2019 World Championship with. So the, the, we're, we've got two designs, one's called the VI-9 and the other's called the BI-9. They're essentially the same sail, um, but they are designed for different boats. So the BI-9 is exclusively for the Beaker boat and the VI-9 is for the Exocet and the Mac-2. They are essentially identical sails, but the Beaker boat, the Beaker sail has slightly different tack detailing just to allow it to uh, fit to that boat a bit easier. Both sails are designed for a, uh, a five 100 uh, millimeter mast. The, the beaker actually used a slightly shorter mast because of the longer king post. Uh, both sails are maximum sail area 8.25 and they both have the 1.25 meter deck sweeper. It, you know, the, the concept of, of the sail is a lower center of effort and uh, you know, better aerodynamics with the bigger deck sweeper, looking for those upwind gains and the higher boat speeds, trying to, uh, trying to basically allow the boat to go faster. This year, we're also uh, continuing our um, reduced sail area. So we've got the DSXR. Again, we're setting this at maximum luff length, 5185, um, but we've reduced the sail area on this sail slightly. So we're looking, this sail's aimed at lighter weight, lighter weight sailors and also for you know, 20 knots of wind plus for, uh, for a conventional, you know, 85 kilo plus sailor. Um, the area on this sail has been lost off the leech, so we've taken a bit off the foot length and a bit off the head, just to bring that sail area down a bit. Anyway, now I'm going to pass over to Rory Scott, who's going to basically talk us through the development of, the, of this latest DSX sail, where we've come from, you know, since we started with the 3DL sale back in 2014. So over to you, Rory. Um, yeah, so as Rob says, uh, I uh, inherited the Moth program back in 2014. I took over from the, uh, the American lot that had been running it up to that stage. Uh, I started working with Rob uh, at that stage and um, we very quickly decided we wanted to move on to a 3D sale. From at that stage, the, uh, certainly the KA sales that were big at the time, and most of the competitors, including the North sales at the time, were all a panel monofilm uh, type sale, very similar to windsurfing sort of technology. Uh, but we wanted to move on to a 3D sale uh, to use uh, to utilize the benefits of that, basically, which was uh, in being able to use super lightweight films uh, and uh, you know uh, the, the the benefits of a 3D molded sail. And uh, so in 2015, we produced the V7, um, which, was, which was a very successful sale. We sold a, a lot of them. Uh, Rob used it amongst others at uh, both the Garda Worlds and the Japan Worlds, I think. Um, and, you know, that sale was, was pretty successful. It was a full height rig back in those days. Um, and, um, you know, we, towards the end of that, 3DL started to... Uh, be replaced by 3DI, um, which uh, forced, forced us basically to look at moving into a 3DI product. Um, and there's a lot of benefits in the 3DI setup uh, and structure, which Flipper's going to talk a lot about uh, later on. Um, but the first sale we basically came up with was the VI7. Um, as I say, Flipper's going to talk a little bit more about the 3DI product later on and how it's actually constructed. But um, we wanted to produce a sail that wasn't too rigid. Uh, one of the big benefits of 3DI is, is it's how, how rigid the structure it is, a very stable structure. But with the moth and, and the sort of uh, nature of sailing those boats, we didn't want to produce a sail that was, was too rigid. 
So we, our first introduction was the VI7, which was a 3DI polyester uh, sail. Um, it was essentially the same mold shape as the 3DL V7 uh, at that stage. Um, full height rig uh, and was, you know, a very good sail at that stage with certainly early liftoff and the sail moved around a lot. Um, ultimately, what we started to learn was it was moving around a little bit too much uh, and was stretching uh, a bit too much in the back and getting a bit get, getting a bit deep at times, so getting a little bit draggy. So the upper end um, of the range, it was you know was starting to become a bit of a handful, certainly for medium and light lightweight guys. Um, so we looked to um, to see what improvements we could make on that. Um, which led us into um, the, the VI8 range. Uh, so if we can move on on that one, Albert. Rory, can I just say a couple of things? Um, yeah. yeah, from my you know, memory, it's obviously you know, a good few years ago now, the, the 3DL sale was a far sale, but it, it didn't go up range that well. We were setting it on the uh, CTEC 3B mast, which is a relatively stiff mast. And um, certainly in the the naught to 15 knots of wind, it was a good sail. Getting over 16 knots, it started to struggle a bit, but you know, it won a lot of regattas. Um, the, uh, the, the first uh, 3DI, um, the polyester 3DI, I, I took to Bermuda in, um, I can't remember what year it was. And actually Ben Payton used it and he did, he did well. He ended up fifth at the regatta. I think 3DL won the regatta. Um, but the first 3DI sail, he, he came fifth and he was, he was super happy with the sail. And, um, you know, it, and that was literally uh, without development, that sail. So out, out of the box, it was a very good sail. But I always felt with the, uh, with the 3DL products that we, are, uh, we struggled up range a little bit. And even putting a softer mast on, on the 3DL, we still wasn't quite as good up range as some of the other stuff. Anyway, back to you. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of that was just how the sail reacted, um, you know, and on a stiffer rig. Um, the 3DL being a pretty rigid structure as well, I think was the main thing for that. But um, the slide I'm showing now is, you know, we started to do a bit of finite element analysis on the, on the sails and on the structures. And we could see on the sail on the left, which was the polyester sail, how much strain actually was going on within the structure. So there was... Um, you can see all the areas up the back of the sail and, and down in the sort of lower leach area uh, where uh, this is basically the, the, the sail is growing. It's, it's not strong enough in that area. So it was deforming there. So we're, as it was getting windier, although it was moving around a lot, it was getting deeper in the head and it was rounding up a little bit in the lower leach. And that's something we wanted to get away from. So um, the sail structure on the right was when we started to introduce some aramid into the sail as well. And that drastically improved the modulus and the strength of the sail. So in doing that, the sail flew a lot um, flatter in the head. Uh, it flew a lot straighter in the lower leech. And in fact, the, the load that you, know, you were putting on through the main sheet and the bang and the Cunningham actually bent the rig a lot more. Uh, and prompted us, I think, a little bit to move into the, the softer mast, uh, you know, area because we needed to build in some sort of um, reaction in the sail because the sail structure itself had become uh, much firmer. I don't know uh, when you first started pulling those sails up, Rob, but there was a big change, right, when you, when you pulled that one up. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, um, you know, from, from the get-go with, uh, with, the, with the black sail, so to speak, we saw a big change and, and then that as you said, it pushed us down the softer rigs and essentially we got to, to where we are now. Yeah, so the, the prompt of, say, if we move on, Albert, the, you know, this the, the put us into the VI8 range um, where we produced three sales in 2018, I think it was, to the, yeah, early part. Um, yeah. The full VI8 replaced the VI7, almost like for like for full height masts. Um, at that stage, we introduced a low aspect sail, um, which we've which lowered the center of effort in the sail a lot, um, and was a pretty quick sail downwind um, when we were up range, uh, and was quicker than the full height VI eight uh, upwind, um, and we also started to get into 
the DS uh, concept with the VI8 DS. Um, at that stage, with the main sheets dropped where they were and, and, and our sort of first attempt at putting a deck sweeper on it, we were only a deck sweeper foot length of around 750 mil. Um, but it did show us that there was, you know, that there was some interest in that DS. Uh, I was a little skeptical about it to begin with um, because there wasn't really a deck to seal against. Uh, and also you're bending the windward side of the sail round the boom. Um, so undoubtedly downwind when you're making the sail deep, you know, that area of the sail looks pretty untidy and pretty, you know, inefficient. Um, but when you're getting it flat and you can do it nicely, then we actually started to see some benefit in it upwind uh, and actually, you know, really quite a marked uh, benefit. So, uh, uh, yeah, if we uh, move on there, I'll be. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing to add there is there's, there's been a big, over the years, obviously getting the centre of effort lower and lower in these boats has been a winner. First of all, we were cutting king posts down and now um, now it's shortening the mast. Um, people have always been worried about not having sail area in the, the optimum place and that's where people were often sceptical on the deck sweepers, especially when they were small deck sweeper, being that you were throwing away sail area and it was not efficient sail area. And I think, you know, it was only really until within the last year that those, um, that, you know, those, that that's all been answered and um, actually seeing how efficient it is. And the, the big change is, you know, a big reduction in drag and then letting yourself go to that next stage of boat speed upwind. So back to you, Roy, we'll look at these mold shapes. Yeah, so this was the evolution of the, of the mold shapes. So as I said, the, when the structure became um, a lot uh, firm, uh, you know, a lot more, lot more rigid. Um, we were flattening the top of the sail uh, a lot, and um, it was it was becoming very, very, um, you know, straight exit down low. So the mold shape had to change quite a lot. Um, in so we can see from the VI seven on the left uh, that the most of the VI eight had a very similar shape, uh, but you can see the shape is uh, much further up in the sail. There's a lot more broad seam. Um, there's nearly double the broad seam in the sails, um, so much deeper moulds, uh, more luff curve in general to accommodate the softer rigs uh, that we needed to use a softer rig with a, with a, with a much more rigid sail. Um, luff curve became a lot more even in distribution um, rather than the VI7, which was very bottom loaded um, and uh, with, with broad seam as well as the luff curve in it. Uh, the section shapes became rounder aft, so we were building shape into the back of the sail. Um, and uh, the, the, at that stage, we felt that the DS sail was going to be our sort of uprange sail. Um, so that sail was actually a little bit flatter uh, than the VI8 and the, and the LA. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's what we were using. And very quickly, people moved, on, moved away from the VI8 uh, as the sale of choice. They were either LA or DS um, for a little while. Uh, I think you used an LA for a little bit. Rob, was that the Aussie Nationals or something like that? Where you were? Yeah, I had one of the first LAs there. And a lot of that was because we were trying to push it down the, the one mast length of 5100, mm -hmm. not yeah. having to have this situation where you're dropping between two masts, one at 5270 and one at 500 always with the aim of trying to get this DS working on the 5100 mast, because we knew certainly at 16 or 17 knots of wind, DSL was going to be fast. Um, and as, as things have evolved, obviously that wind speeds come way down. Uh, but what, you know, one thing on that VI8, we know now that that's still a very valid mold and um, you know, sub nine knots of wind, that sail is, um, is very potent. Yeah, for sure. It's the first sail that gets you out of the water and uh, and gets you going around the racetrack. So if you had a light air venue, I don't know, Japan or somewhere like that, then uh, you know, I, I could see people going back into that down that route uh, rather than the uh, than the shorter rig length. But um, moving on, this uh, you know the the, the DS uh, sail did start to really make us think a little bit about it. So we started to model uh, the DS um, in flow. And um, 
we did start to see the real benefit of making that DS section as big as possible, basically. Uh, it's certainly upwind uh, in order, as you say, to, you know, if we can get the induced drag uh, off the bottom of the sail, uh, get that bigger, you know, it, it turned into quite a substantial boat speed increase. Um, it's not what you would do if you were just designing a sail for your downwind stuff all the time, but uh, it's certainly upwind where your apparent wind speeds are, are pretty bloody high. Um, it was making a was making a big difference. So that prompted us to really, um, you know, have a look at what we could do um, in order to maximise the deck sweeper part of the sail uh, without prohibiting the guys to actually, you know, you just still got to get around the racetrack, you got to get under the boom and you've got it around the back of it and things. So uh, that's what sort of took us down the VI9 route. But I think, um, you know, uh, I think uh, in, in order to um, push that, you know, if we're putting a lot of, lot more area into the deck sweeper, you know, we increased it from 750 on foot length to 1250, uh, which is a fairly major change and quite a lot of sail area taken away from the sail. Uh, we took the decision to make the sail a bit deeper uh, in order to help push it, push it back down the range a little bit, or or move the, you know, the, the point where it became strong, move it down a little bit. Uh, we also um, uh, looked at just refining the luff curve a little. We took a, a little bit out of the very head of the sail, and we took out a little bit in the very tack, and that tidied up the leeward side of the luff sleeve uh, nicely. Um, which helped just you know improve the efficiency and reduce drag in the sail. Well, that's ultimately the sail that Rob and Tom had at the uh, at the Worlds in Perth. Yeah, I mean there was probably ten of them there at the Worlds, um, and we, we, you know we haven't changed that mould shape since Perth. Um, we've made a few geometry changes since Perth, i.e. The, the the deck sweeper portions got a bit bigger, but the uh, you know, the feel very much was when we made, when we went to the DSX sale, as Rory was saying, when we went to the DSX sale, we wanted to make the sail a little bit deeper, just so it's got a bit more range in it. And, and one thing, with, you know, one thing, the sails get flat enough. There's, there's no problem with getting the sail flat enough. And I think what can happen in, in the moth class quite easily is that people get their sails overly flat and then they become unresponsive you run out of all the luff round and essentially the whole thing's locked up. So I think it's, um, you've got to be a bit cautious about getting overly flat. I know the boats are hugely overpowered upwind and people are always thinking, I've got to get myself flat or I've got, I've got to get myself flatter. But there are inherent problems if you do go make the sail too flat, uh, the boat can become difficult to sail and, um, and, and actually you can in increase drag on the whole thing. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to just just scroll on one, Albion. We'll um, we'll uh, we're going to cross over to uh, to Flipper here, who's going to tell us tell us a bit about 3DI and the material we use in in the mod zone. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, thanks for uh, joining this uh, webcast. I'm just going to uh, spend a few minutes touching on uh, 3DI and actually the. Uh, you know, the structure of 3DI, uh, you know, everyone on this call, you're all uh, off tracks in some way or form, and I'm sure you have a, a pretty good understanding of uh, composite construction. And 3DI is a very, 3DI raw and 3DI 360, very simply is a uh, flexible filament-based thermoset prepreg system. So it's no different to your hull, or to your mast, except we use a flexible resin system, which enables the uh, sail to be deformed, rolled, uh, bent, but it's using exactly the same technology as the hull of your boat. Got the next slide there. So uh, this short uh, video that's going to play for about 30 seconds, just gives you an overview of what 3DI is and how it actually is uh, formed, the steps we use. We use uh, robotics the whole way throughout the production uh, process. And we, we just go through these multi-stages of up various the sale 
and each sail is engineered and the structure is engineered specific to the application <coughs> this video you're seeing here is giving an indication of our one reef main saw with the various components being laid down step by step you can see each of the uh, robotic layers coming down there's the reef structure in, in purple going on. Top reinforcements of uh, clue tack patching. Then the molds inflated, vacuum bagged, heated and cured. Got the next slide there. So uh, the latest DSX mainsaw, there's a, uh, here's a screen image, which I will just allow you just to read some of the, uh, the key points in. This is, a, this is a summary of the structure that compactly in the latest DSX sail. So the total mass or the weight of the sail membrane is just, uh, just on 2.3, nearly 2.4 kilos. It's a spread filament pre-preg thermoset adhesive system flexible resin system so you can deform it, you can fold it, you can crunch it. The total number of tapes that I'll be uh, showing you actually the inner workings of this uh, structure, there's 473 meters of tape in, in the uh, base membrane, which is made up of 515 individual tapes. The composite is basically a blend between 66% of an aramid polyester hybrid and then 33% uh, pure polyester, which we use on the exteriors. And then we have about 1% of what we call a non-woven reme substrate, which we use for locating um, calibration marks and just uh, kind of style tracks. Uh, and the key to the 3DI structure is the end cell is three-dimensionally molded. So these two images here, the image on the left, uh, North Sales, we're very proud of our technology. We build all our own uh, pre-preg tapes for every 3DI sale that we build uh, globally. We have two uh, Prega lines, one in uh, Minden, Nevada for big boat sales, basically sales uh, over the side of, let's say around a 60 foot boat or a 20 meter uh, length overall boat. And then in Sri Lanka, we have another Prega line, which does uh, everything from one design up uh, through TP52 type size up to that 60 footer. And then on the image on the right is our own uh, robotics. We design, engineer, manufacture all our own robotics for our, our uh, image on there is one of our tape laying heads which takes those um, pre-preg tapes and then lays them down. The pre-preg tapes are the same as the manufacturer of your boat. They need to be stored in a refrigerated uh, container and on standby for uh, each of the custom orders that go through the factory. So this next image gets into the nitty gritty of the uh, structure within the sail. So the MOS sail that we're talking about, the DSX, has 13 individual uh, layers involved. So starting on the right, the purple layer there is, um, is a polyester exterior. It's a, uh, what we call a uh, leech group polyester exterior. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, next one, the light green is a leech strainer. That's uh, where we first start stepping into Aramid, where we want third one along is getting into the leech structure clue to head we're addressing the loads as you sheet on as you bang on and being able to support the uh, loads the whole way up from the clue through the mid leech up into the head next along is what we call a uh, luff structure bias luff structure that's starting to address the loads that are coming out of the Cunningham area and going up diagonally up through the sail to each of the batten pockets. The uh, grey one coming along next, I think is starting to get uh, fairly self-explanatory. I hope that's the uh, batten detail. That's the, what we call the strainers for the battens, which are taking care of the 
compressive uh, loads that the uh, battens are putting on the sail membrane. The next two small, uh, the yellow and the uh, magenta colored ones, they're the port and the starboard side of the batten pocket. So we're actually laying inside to, uh, I believe, layers six and seven by this stage. They're the either side of the batten pocket. And then basically we reverse the process as a general statement. Here comes, here comes the uh, other batten strainers on the other side. And you can also see the detail of the reinforcing on the leech and the lap of the batten to address the uh, loads. Then we come back again to the uh, luff, stru luff structure. Leech structure is the blue. So it's kind of the reverse of the, um, the, the third uh, layer that I started with, but obviously all the tapes don't actually overlay with each other. They all, they all intersect with each other to give complete coverage over the sail. The next one is quite a good one. And maybe Albie, if you can get your pointer down in the Cunningham area, this crimson colored red one is showing, it's showing the edge reinforcing the whole way around last head foot, but the Cunningham really attending to the incredible loads that you guys are putting on the Cunningham and uh, Chris from CST is gonna be addressing this. So we have the ability to engineer the structure and really put the, uh, you know, the, the right materials where we need that to address the loads. So second last uh, layer is actually what we call a compressive layer. We're back to 100% polyester on this layer. It's an external layer again. And that's the one that's dealing with the compressive loads on the sail. Addressing what Rory was talking about as an example, the difference between an all polyester sail and an aramid sail. We need the aramid structure to support the sail and support the loading you guys are putting on it. But this compressive loading actually keeps everything kind of in place and keeps the sail millimetre perfect in its flying shape. So there's no distortion, there's no loss of area as you're sailing and sheeting on. And then very, very, very long, it's actually a rubber layer that we put on. It's what we call the, uh, the trim lines. So we just put a non-woven reme surface around the outside and then all those little black dots that you can see, they're all the uh, robotic markings. So when we go to uh, take these, these sections, put them on the 3D mold, uh, we have uh, very, very accurate laser controlled identifiers to ensure every sale is ident identical. So here, just a couple of uh, pictures. This is our, uh, one of our facilities in uh, Sri Lanka. This is a dedicated one design, uh, 3DI, uh, one of the many 3DI, one design uh, robotic centers. So here you can see, this is actually, was a uh, polyester test sale we were doing for calibration for the DSX. And you can see the uh, various uh, components here. That one that the, that the um, pointer is on at the moment is that bottom, uh, bottom section. So we go from these flat sections, if you can go to the next slide. Then the sections are draped over the, draped over the mold using those identifiers. You'll see the uh, gentleman on the left, uh, the operator, He's uh, actually calibrating all those, uh, all those identification, identification marks to make sure that we're millimetre perfect. Then a vacuum bag goes over the top. Just go to the last slide, please, Abby. Vacuum bag over the top, suck it down and uh, apply heat. We, uh, we cure the sail on the, on the mould and then it goes straight off the mould and goes onto a, uh, a post-curing uh, floor, a flat floor that's humidity controlled. And then uh, once it's actually completed, it's uh, kind of uh, uh, green time into a cured state. We then go off into the finishing floor and the sail makers do all their magic. I think that's it. Great, Flipper, thank you very much. And I think what it, sh it shows, you know, the, the process we use to build a sale is pretty full on. Firstly, sort of say the feedback uh, to Rory Scott in the design office, and designing the sale, working through with the computer software, to the guys designing the structure, 
and then, and then out to the guys who are actually building the mold. And then obviously that mold, mold goes to finishing, luff tube going on and all of that. So the, the, the stages and the technology involved in the whole thing uh, is fascinating really. Um, all right, Flipper, thank you very much. Um, we're just moving on a bit to now a bit more detail on the, um, on the 2020 sales, the DSX, uh, as we've touched on a lot already in, the, in this uh, webinar, is, is this DS. And again, in, in the last year or two, it's amazing where it's come from um, in terms of quite small DSs, sort of above a four deck. We've now got obviously on the right here, the, the beaker boat, which is very much designed around having a deck sweeper sail. Um, just you can see there the, the most right hand shot is um, a very nice looking DSX with a with the deck fairing underneath so fully and end plated. Um, some of the details we've tried to put into this new deck sweeper. Uh, if you go to the top left picture here, you can see we've got these uh, Velcro upstands and these are to, to connect the two skins of the deck sweeper. Um, firstly, to make sure that they, they can't move independently but also to adjust the width between them so you can actually add some shaping. They're spaced fore and aft along the, uh, along the deck sweeper so you can actually add some shaping in. And you can see in the middle picture, we've obviously got the diagonal baton, which uh, runs into the, uh, the wadding of uh, the very bottom horizontal baton. Um, and we've also got the two horizontal batons, which uh, just to try to help create some shape into this deck sweeper, give it some rigidity and uh, make sure that it's really uh, creating an, an aerodynamic shape. Uh, one of the things that we found has been very useful is the zip up the back of the deck sweeper, which actually holds the two skins together and um, it, it stops them shearing when, uh, when, the, uh, when the boom goes in and out. And that is one of the things we found made, made a big difference. And in Perth, we were, we were fitting a lot of zips to a lot of sails uh, all right, if you just go on to the next one, Alvi. Hey, Rob, just um, if I can uh, interrupt just one second. There's a, uh, a good question from uh, one of our um, viewers here uh, asking about luff, luff pocket material and distortion coming out of our luff pockets and uh, what, to, what are our thoughts on that and is there any development um, in that area? Yeah, yeah. yeah so on the, uh, on the uh, luff pocket. Thanks for the question, Fetty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, fairly thanks. Uh, on the Luff Pocket, obviously, you know, it, it is always a very difficult task. We're trying to bend, you know, bend a sail around a, a mast, which is changing shape a lot. So at some stages, there are creases. We've, used, we've, we've gone back to a, a purely Dacron pocket, and if Rory's there, he'll probably better butt in on this. But we did have a, um, a Teflon front to it, which was good, but it, maybe the wear on it wasn't ideal. Um, but we're very happy with the, with the, with the, uh, with the Dacron pocket. I think we generally get it to set up very smoothly, obviously around deck sweeper areas. It is, you know, you can get creases and that's, that's constantly evolving how we get that perfectly fair around there. But, um, we're very happy with, with the cloth we're using at the moment. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the weight of it, but, um, it's a, <clears throat> it's a three, eight polypreg. Uh, 3.8 and 3 um, polypreg Dacron rope. Um, yep. So it and it's it's cut on the roll of cloth so that it's it's at its strongest straight up the luff. So when we're pulling down hard on the cunning uh, on the new, you probably actually see it in that right hand picture there. We're actually pulling on the sleeve now as well. So it has some strength in the direction of the mast essentially. Um, and, and then it's actually the way it's woven, it's trying to be as soft and as supple in every other direction as possible to try and pick up some of the range of mast bends that, um, that you know, that we make this mast go, uh, this sail go through. Um, and what, one thing we've done, Rory, over the years, we've certainly tested a lot of materials on the Luff tube, done yeah. a full circle on it a couple of times. Yeah, exactly. And we're back to really using the same stuff as we started out. And, uh, you know, I think across the range it goes pretty well. Um, we've tried cutting it in different angles, trying cutting it on the bias and stitching it back together. To, but uh, it, uh, you know, it was never as successful. Uh, yeah, I'd absolutely. Get getting the lock curve back out of it down low on and up high on the on the nine 
uh, and you know careful shimming of your cams uh, means that you can generally get that you know if you get it set up nicely you can get it pr pretty smooth most of the time yeah i mean i i certainly don't see any issues that we need to address in the in the luff tubes at, at the moment uh especially in the new the, the 2020 dsx's even around the whole the whole deck sweeper area it's it's really beginning to look very very fair which is nice um alby sorry can you just go up one slide uh, other way mate yeah i just wanted to just talk about i forgot to talk about the size of the deck sweeper um and you know that this is basically gone from 750 millimeters to now 1250 from the uh, from the very front of the luff tube and in perth uh tom slingsby used um a deck sweeper at uh, uh one meter and 50 so 1050 so we've come 150 mil bigger since perth i've sailed with this sail at the states and it was good it was a really good sail this is the 1250 deck sweeper i'm talking about the reason why you know we, we've we felt that as soon as we've gone bigger on the deck sweeper the boat's gone better and better um and then obviously following on from perth we're like right we've got to go to the, the next jump right away is doing the bigger deck sweeper so we made the decision to jump straight to 1250 that way just to avoid a 50 millimeter incremental change every year which I, which the feeling was that was just going to you know get annoying if that every year we just went 50 mil bigger so we've made the jump to 1250 you know it's obviously main sheet drops further back in the boat and and main sheet hang it on the boom a bit further back but um it's very very achievable and saving it has been no no dramas so you know the aim was there to get it done in one hit rather than doing it bit by bit bit by bit um all right thanks albie we can roll on Um, yeah, so this is, uh, well, just, just get back up one more, sorry. I just want to talk about the difference between the, um, so on this, on this slide here, the Beaker sail on the left, the BI-9, and the Exocet Mac 2 sail on the right, the BI-9. The, the, the sails are identical, the mould shape's identical, the deck sweeper size is, is the same. The, uh, the, the differences are just in tack de detailing. The, the Beko uses a slightly shorter mast, and this is because the king post is slightly longer. So the tack of the mainsail inside the deck sweeper itself is slightly higher so that it, it doesn't crash into the boom. Um, and then likewise, because the beaker has got a, a fatter king post, we've, we've made a Velcro patch around the front to, to basically you know, cater for this increase, essentially putting the fatter king post in sucks away a lot of luff around there so we need to you know fare the sail in around that king post so there's a larger cutaway under that velcro and then the velcro just covers over the area and on the on the vi9 on the right you can see there's just a, a nice cutaway for the sail to you know come around the foredeck and then uh, and then blend in nicely you can see uh, the uh, cunning and webbings um on on the sail there which are identical on both sails Obviously, on the beaker sail, it's just hidden underneath the Velcro. And if you just go on to the next one, Albie, we'll just look at that. Kind of not that we're going to talk about it. So we we're using one Cunningham system to do inside and outside. Here, this is you know the most complicated system with with hooks on the inside and outside. But you do you can get away with just hooks on the outside. That that Cunningham system is available on our website. Uh, this is set up by Alex Heyman. And, um, you know, if you look at the North website, you'll see that kind of system on there and, you know, feel free to copy it. Um, all right, that's sort of bring us to uh, the end of the bit on sales. We're now going to go um, to Chris Dixon, who's going to talk us through um, CST masts and his, his new Topro range of masts. Thanks, Rob. Um, thanks for having us on the webinar. It's good for you guys to organize this and, um, Get the moth community together and, and others, I guess. Um, but today, I just want to cover sort of three main areas. Really, we'll give you a, a bit of a background on CST. Um, a lot of people know CST, but we'll, we'll fill in some of the gaps. 
um, and then why, you know, we've changed to this TOPRO mask setup, and then we'll cover a bit more detail about it. Um, so CST, we've been in business 25 years this year, which is a great milestone to reach. Um, I've been part of the business for coming up to 20 years this year, so um, it's been a, a, a long slog, but um, we've got two, two factories based in Sydney, and we'd be probably 90% export. Um, we started in the marine industry uh, 25 years ago because that was really our that was our passion, and um, we had a lot of enthusiasm to to start making composite products uh, for the marine game. Um, and over the years, we had to we diversified into automotive, aerospace, defence, and industrial products. Uh, we produce roughly probably two and a half thousand tubes a week at the moment, which we convert into up to 130,000 parts a week of varying types. Um, so we've really managed to scale up over the years um, to get the volume to get the volume up. Uh, Rob, if you want to change to the next slide there, Albie. Um, these are some of the customers that we deal with um, across the range from sailing to automotive to aerospace. Um, you know, having customers like this really um, sort of force us to develop really good quality systems so we can control the products that we're sending out to them and get really good consistency and reliability. Can we go to the next one, Albie. Uh, with the Marine, we've won many world titles over the years. Uh, you know, our spas have won many world titles over the years. I think there's been nine moth worlds now with our products, which we're pretty proud of. Um, pretty cutting edge technology, the moths. And we find that there's a lot of trickle down from our high end sort of aerospace customers to moths. There's a lot of sort of cross pollination between the two sort of areas. Um, we do a lot, of, a lot of different products ranging from dinghies to 50 foot keel boats. Um, over the last few years, we've really sort of forced ourselves to focus on um, building a lot of a lot of vertical integration into the business so that we could increase our capacity. Um, we spent a lot of time building our own machines. So I suppose we've got a, a similar sort of methodology to, to Norths. You know, we build our own winding machines um, and we, we scale up the volume. So um, with the quality, this is a bit of a, a quick snippet of the quality system. Uh, you can see the graph down there with all the bar graphs. So every tube that goes through the system gets measured, weighed, uh, diameter checks, uh, depending on the customer specifications, some get bend tested. The lower part of the screen there, you can see all of our data logging. So we've got humidity controlled rooms, temperature controlled rooms, uh, oven curing, post curing. Uh, there's a specification for every product that goes through. There's a really tight specification, whether it be weight, diameter, torsional, you know, properties. Uh, and it's all built in. So it's a, a go, no go system as the operators um, track each batch and they confirm the details. They, um, they get tolerances that will either pass it or fail it. You can actually see there's a red one there, which has failed in the system. Um, so it's really, it's really quite robust now. Um, we understand our properties really well. So Usually if there's uh, something that goes wrong internally or whether it's a fiber or a weight that doesn't match up, it gets caught in the system before it goes out to the customer. And that's really critical part of our business. Um, the fibers, a lot of you guys have seen fibers over the past, um, whether you've done a bit of laminating yourself, but you know, they're quite common terminologies that are discussed amongst the industry, standard modulus, intermediate modulus, uh, high modulus, ultra high. Um, you know, the quality doesn't just go to our outgoing products. It's also got to do with our incoming products. So we have incoming inspections on all the raw materials. Um, we have certain testing that we do. So we basically check our suppliers and make sure if they say they're going to give us 380 gigapascal fiber, they're giving us 380. Um, you know, over the years we've found there is a lot of variation there. 
Um, so the beauty of our process is if we have a, a product that, so the fibre isn't 380, we can tune the, the patterns to match so that we get, you know, really good repeatability on our bends, which is important for the sale makers. I'm sure they vouch for that. Um, and that gives us a, a, really one of our key strengths, I'd say, is, is understanding our fibres and being able to tune around those batches to give us a, a very repeatable product. I'm going to flip to the next one, Howie. All right, so why did we change to go to this TOPRO system? Um, I suppose we, we, had, we had a good opportunity to change here. Um, we'd, we'd had a, the last three worlds have been won by Paul Goodison with our, our DS series Mars. So we had some really good runs on the board. Um, the product was really good, but we saw a bit of a change coming through with like the sale technology, but as well as the sale designs um, moving towards the deck sweepers. So we can see going forward that going shorter and shorter masts, and originally they were like 53, 50 masts, they came down to sort of 5,100 or five metre masts. Um, as the span gets shorter, the mast is inherently going to become stiffer. So we thought we have to go softer with that and also lowering the center of effort um, sort of was indicating to us that the sails would probably need to go deeper as well um, because of the lower center of effort and need to produce some more power. So we thought probably with softer masts, we'd be able to get a bigger range out of the, out of the, um, out of the mast as well. Um, I think when we went to change, it was, maybe by luck that we, we sort of come across with Rob and the North team at the same time. Um, they were changing their technology and the opportunity to sort of develop the mast and the sail package together at the same time was probably the best integration package that we could do. Um, so we went about, we changed the mandrel geometry um, from where we were at. Um, the mandrels that we had before were, you know, probably 10 years old and it was a geometry that was that was built for sales back then. Um, we had uh, uh, a number of different sort of laminates that we'd had in the past. We changed from wet winding to a, a pre-impregnated tow, which is called tow preg. Um, so a few of these drivers also were driven by um, the ability we wanted to be able to sort of tool up ourselves and create more capacity and more volume so we could respond quickly. Um, so going to the tow preg enabled us to do that. Um, so we went from being able to sort of wind one mast a day through to doing up to eight masts a day now. Um, so it's a significant turnaround in terms of volume. Um, we also saw an opportunity to um, uh, change the fittings and the appearance of the mast. So we spent a lot of time uh, starting from scratch, basically, we started with a, the DS was our, the DS2 was our uh, base for the, the bend. We thought that was a pretty good sort of bend to start with, with the intention of going softer from there. Um, so we redesigned the laminate and optimised our fibre layouts um, for compression as well as some torsional effects. Um, and then we redesigned all the fittings. Um, we understand that the loads, as it was going to get shorter, the loads were going to increase on the four stay fittings as well as the heel plugs. Um, so we went to a metal combination um, and the yeah, metal's quite good. We, we've learned quite a lot through our aerospace partners about metal, metal and composite interaction. Um, so we thought this was a good opportunity to enhance that and um, that also allowed us to upscale. We've got a lot of Akuma machine centers in our factory. So we had the ability to machine fittings quickly and hard anodize them, which would protect them from corrosion quite a lot. And um, so, yeah, there was the other driver behind it was um, being able to swap between tips. And typically the masks that we'd made in the past were one base, one tip together. Um, so it was quite expensive for the moth guys. You'd end up with a DS2 and a DS4, and then you'd end up with a couple of sails. Um, so we had a look across the range and the base panels were, were all were very similar. Um, we saw an opportunity to be able to swap tips. So 
we changed the, the manufacturing techniques so we could um, machine the joints now with a tapered, a tapered lock joint. Um, so that got rid of a lot of the slot. It also gave us a lot better repeatability um, between bases and tips. So we could now provide two or three tips and people would be able to decide what tip they wanted and interchange them quite easily. Uh, I just want to slide to the next one from there. Okay, so this is a little video. You can play that and I'll just talk while it's going. This was a from our windsurfer development, which was a couple of years before the TOPRO started, um, but this technology trickled into the TOPRO. Uh, we have a, an opposition mast on the right-hand side and our windsurfer mast on the left-hand side. There've been some inherent issues with, with mast failures um, while rigging up on the beach. So our aim was to have the same stiffness profile and the same bend characteristics, but improve the toughness. So I think the mast on the right bent to 700 millimetres and 130 kilos. We managed to make the mast eventually go into production, bending at 1100 millimetres and breaking at 155. Um, so that was, that was the same sort of um, philosophy that we've gone with the, the TOPRO mast. Um, optimise our fibres, optimise the mandrel technology, um, and also go with the same sort of joint designs that we did with the windsurfers. So nice, Chris. So I think this, this next slide on the bend will be, you know, most interesting to a lot of our, our moth guys. The, um, yeah. So as you were saying before, the, um, your range now is fully interchangeable. So you can put whatever base with whatever tip you want. That's correct. Yep. Yep. So when we first started this, we started with the deck sweeper mass and we had, we started with two lengths really, five meter and a 5,100. Um, and we had two bases and three tips. And yeah. what, we, what we didn't want to do, we didn't want to really sort of dictate to the market and say, oh, this is, this is your option, you know, and, and lock people in. We wanted, we wanted to sort of say, well, here's two bases and here's a couple of tips with different bends. You guys go out and try them because everyone has different techniques and different sales and, you know, Rob, Rob based a lot of his developments around and, and really around, you know, trying the different tips and getting the feel for it and then, you know, developing their designs around that. Um, so, you know, it, it was giving more flexibility, I guess, is what we were trying to achieve by having tips available and then a natural selection process, you know, yeah. came about. And then so just looking at this chart here, the, the, yeah. uh, the DS2 was always the sort of, pretty, uh, you know, a good mast, not, not too stiff, but below that was DS1, which I think is what Paul Goodison used and the, and the DS0. Um, yes. It was certainly clear to me that, you know, uh, Goody was going well using a much softer rig. And on, on this graph here, the, the, the CTEC 3B is actually the red line on the bottom. And, um, and I think the DS0 is the very top line. So it's quite a significant difference uh, so the, the lines go DS0 on top, DS1, and then DS2, then the 3C, and the red line being the 3B. So where we were, if we, if we just go through the, put a timeline on it, with the 3DL sale um, and the, and the CTEC 3B, we were, uh, you know, a much stiffer combination with less luff round. And then, you know, we take it on to today, to today where we, we're running, you know, say a, a DS1, which is one of those top three lines, depending on what combination you use, you know, so a much more, a lot more mass bend with a lot more luff round. And, and so Chris, just tell us here then, your, um, your BV1 relates to what, uh, essentially what was the DS1? Yes, yeah, so the, the bases, um, the BV1 and the, TV1 were sort of effectively, you know, similar to the DS1. The DS1 and DS2 were very similar in bends. There wasn't a lot between the two. Um, but the BV1 and TV1 were, were typically um, the sort of standard there with when the deck sweepers came out. Um, yeah, got, got you. I mean, one yeah. thing I've noticed with, with your mass range is they are 
you know, compared to other brands, it's a lot closer. When you change tip, it's, it's not a significant difference. It's a subtle yep. change. And I, and I think that's often what's enough to make the change. It's just a, a very subtle change. Um, yeah, and then, and and that, sorry. sorry, then further down the line, I was using a, um, a BV half and a TV half at the Worlds. And those were available masks. Yeah, they're, they're available. So they're, they're probably another sort of similar sort of step down um, between the blue and the black line. Then the BV 0.5 and the TV 0.5 will be the same step down again. So it's softer again than the BV1, TV1. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, so I guess what we've what we learned from the past with all the, the DS developments with, with, um, with Paul Woodison in the past and um, and the other sailors was, you know, if, if we started making the increment too big between them, between um, say like a DS2 and a DS4, that they'd end up just staying on the DS2 the whole time. So we ended up with these finer increments and um, something that doesn't really show on a static bend test like that is really, you know, once it's in the sail and there's a lot of, there's a lot of compression with the amount of laugh round that you're running now. Um, the compression really exaggerates a lot of the bend. Um, and then that will show up yeah. whether it's more tip bend or mid bend. Um, that'll show sort of a bit more under compression. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as, as you know, it's, it's subtle changes. Albie, why don't you just move on to the next one? And um, I, I drew up this sort of equipment, you know, choice, because there's a lot of people out there with different body weights and trying to understand what to use when and um i think what we'll try to do is put this up on our website but it, essentially you, you know at the world i used you you measure in two masks so i used the b1 t1 and then when it got windier i'm in the 75 to 85 kilo weight range and i used the b1 t1 and the the, the, the b half t half i had one sale which was the dsx which i used the whole time I think now, you know, I guess that range, you know, for light air, I could be on a, on a bigger cell then I would need that, that longer mast. Um, but uh, I was using a relatively straightforward combination. I think if you were lighter, you could go to a slightly softer rig, um, again, with a, depending on what cell you want to use. And then what, what, what I haven't put on here is obviously you can interchange those mast combinations. So sometimes I would use the, the B1 base with a, a T half tip. Um, and I, I don't think the bases are too critical because you've got the spread of air holding it in place. So I think the, uh, the, the base is slightly less sensitive. Um, we'll keep moving on, so as we're gonna hold up too much time. Uh, so Chris, just talk us through your new fittings quickly. Okay, so like obviously all our fittings were, were carbon before um, with the increase of load, you can see we, we tested, we've got an Intron testing machine here. So we set up jigs and, and break it. It's all sort of fed back and recorded. Um, so the old carbon fiber force of four stay fittings used to take about 1300 kilos. Um, we then changed to metal and we anodize all that sort of stuff in house as well. So we went through a whole bunch of anodizing techniques to try and get the right combination. Um, that then went up to 1700 kilos when it was breaking the shackles, which was quite repeatable. Um, and then we, we upped it up to about 2100 kilos where it starts really ripping the laminate apart. Um, so we haven't really sort of seen any of those failures. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a sort of short gist of, of the metal fittings. Um, adhesives are critical in gluing all these fittings on, whether it be main sheet hangers or four state fittings. Um, so, you know, we, we typically use Plexus, um, which is a, a great adhesive. It's a methyl methacrylate adhesive. And the benefit is it's got a great temperature range, as you can see up the top there, um, minus 55 to 121 degrees C. It's got a great range that it can go through. Um, so that means that it won't go soft. It won't peel off the mast easily. Um, that's also a little bit sort of um, not foolproof, but you know, if you must make mistakes putting it on because it's a methyl methacrylate, it really it, it etches into the surface and it'll, it'll, it'll sort of bond itself really well compared to an epoxy, which really needs great surface preparation. 
So you're um, saying you use the plexus, not the spar bond? Yeah, yeah. We've done a lot of testing. Look, look, spar bond can be successful as well. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not, but um, you know, there was there were some issues in Perth that we saw with some people had fittings that had been glued on um, with spar bond that had come off. Um, and you look at the the TG there, and I guess, I guess that comes down to really understanding the adhesives that you're going to use to glue things on and the cure time, how long it takes for it to really go hard and reach the right sort of TGs, which is where it goes soft. Um, so, you know, there's no point sort of gluing it on expecting to sail with it the next morning. If it's a 45 degree day, it's not going to work. Um, yeah, so, coffee. you know, we, with all of our, all of our fittings that we glue on, we're using that, that product and we've done lots and lots of testing and I'm, I'm pretty confident with that. So, um, if you just want to flick to the next slide there. Um, so, you know, I guess the, the first reaction of a lot of people is with, with aluminium fittings um, is corrosion. Um, so we, we decided to sort of address this straight off the bat and we built a, a corrosion chamber in house and we put all of our fittings in there. We put about 40 samples in there for about four weeks in, in an accelerated environment. Um, and we had all sorts of different anodizing. So we added the wits, it's all hard anodized, um, but we had different techniques. So we tested that. The one on the right was one technique, which didn't work. And you can see the one on the left, which was in the same environment for the same amount of time. Um, and that came out with virtually no corrosion on it. Um, so, so with, with so the aluminium. What fittings are you using in aluminium now? Just the shroud and the spreader? Yeah, the fourth day and the spreader. Um, we've also got the male heel plugs um, because with the most most of the boats now are going to a female heel plug, where the the male fitting is built into the boat. Um, but on some of the older boats, the Mac twos that have still got a female heel plug in the boat and a male heel plug in the mast, we've got a machined um, metal fitting in the bottom of that. Um, so it's really about isolating. The material, the metal from the carbon fiber. Um, so we've got a number of techniques, but we've sort of, you know, tested it to make sure that, that works. So, um, you know, I think we've sort of really covered our bases there. We've flopped to the next um, video or the next screen. This just gives you a bit of a sneak peek on some of the developments coming up. Um, so we use a lot of our 3D printers just to rapid prototype. Um, parts. Um, so this is like a lever bang that we're developing at the moment, which will have the pulley built into the end of it, um, which has been requested for a little while. But um, anyway, that should be the next couple of weeks, three or four weeks, we'll probably have that through the machining shop and into the testing lab. So what's we'll... going to happen there then in the top picture, you're going to glue on that place onto the boom? Yeah, so that's a metal, that's a, that... that's a metal saddle. Right, that would be metal. Like, yeah. Yeah, so um, it'll be a, we'll be able to make it lighter and it'll have a greater bearing strength than what we've got now. And it'll be also be a lot smaller. Um, it's just a lot more streamlined on the boom. Um, so that'll be for the top end and then the bottom end will have the, the pulley system available um, with a high load sheave in it that will we'll test to make sure that they can take the load. Um, we still have some other boom fittings as well, new hangers and bang attachment points and that sort of thing that, the work, that we're working on next week. Um, so they should come through the system fairly quickly. So are you doing a new boom? I've heard rumours. Uh, we, <laughs> we've had a new boom on the, on the list for a very, very long time and we keep flip-flocking back and forward. Um, it, really, it really comes down to the development time. So. Uh, the, the boom is one we've got. We've got two different designs that we've been looking at. Um, we've been hanging off, and I'm, I'm not sure whether we're going to hit the go button on those yet. Um, yeah, we've got, got yeah. a really long development list, and that's one that will take a fairly big chunk out of out of it. So at the moment, and, that one is still on hold. And, yeah, and just on your masts, you, you know, essentially to, to customers, anything's possible in terms of stiffness. If they want something softer, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Look, we're always we're always open to um, to to suggestions, and you know, I, I guess something that we've done with this, something that we didn't talk about with the mask, was we also we've standardized standardized the layout 
a bit more on the other. The four stays moved up, you know, 100 millimetres from 1700 to 1800. But we sort of standardised the four stay and the spreader location. So that's going to make it easier for the sail makers. Um, hopefully it makes it easier for people so they don't have to have so many different rigging kits for different masts and different layouts. Um, and yeah, it it certainly what, what Slingsby had at the Worlds where he was... He had the sale of running that he had the option of running the long mast and the short mast. Um, yep. So he just had he had one long base, and then mm -hmm. so that meant he had the option of two tips on either yep. rig height, which is yep. is the right way to do it if you're going to do um, if you want to run two rig heights, just yep. have one long base and one short base with the same tips, and then uh, yep. then you then you're well covered. Yeah, yeah. All right, okay. excellent. Good. Chris, thank you very much. And um, thank you everybody for joining us. I think that, you know, there's a lot of information on there. This, uh, this webinar will be available online. Um, so please feel free to go back through it all. Um, shoot us any questions you need to ask. Um, there's a lot to absorb there, but um, you know, it's good to see that there's plenty of evolution going on and, um, and uh, we'll see, see where we get to this year. Thank you very much. And uh, next week, we've got uh, Tom Slingsby talking about uh, setting, up, uh, setting up the sale and, and how to make it go fast. So I uh, look forward to seeing you all then. Cheers.